Now, a while back on the podcast, we issued a challenge to see if anyone could find us a kit car that truly didn't need anything because every kit car listing on the planet always says, well, it just needs this or that to finish. And of course, in reality, it's always far more than what the seller is uh, purporting. But I think we actually found the kit car that doesn't need anything I don't believe it doesn't exist. It, it uh, does exist. I exist. almost bid on it. I did almost, you really? <laughs> I did. It was a Lamborghini kit car, and by golly, I was tempted. So just recently on Bring a Trailer, John Cena's BMW V12 powered Lamborghini Diablo VT Roadster replica sold, and it sold for a lot of money. It sold for a hundred forty six thousand dollars, which is not too far off where some bad Diablos have <laughs> almost not sold. <laughs> that is what so many guys wish they could get for their kit cars. That's a real I, car. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But in looking at this listing, it sparked kind of an interesting thought in my mind. And that is, are there kit cars that are better than the real actual car that they are faking? Rep replicating and looking through this listing it is pretty amazing uh how well this car was built now john cena went through a lot of drama building this car he went through i think five different mechanics that ripped him off or did not complete the job uh or or were underqualified before he found somebody that could actually finish it and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars building this replica probably started out as what he thought was a good idea kind of like restoring a wooden boat uh or buying a, a you know historic project home or something like that uh and you know obviously you know, anybody that can do math could have said, well, in that time for that money, you could have just bought a real Lamborghini. But he bought it early on in his career when he didn't have a ton of money and thought this would be the shortcut, which I think a lot of kit car people do. But if you look at the photos, the proportions are right. It's a custom tube frame. It is it has a V12 BMW engine out of a 1988 750IL. So not a super powerful one, but it's still a BMW V12. And, you know, let's be honest. I mean, McLaren F1 used a BMW V12, and they're not a kit car. So there, there's some engine swap heritage I, there. I mean, you know, I'll allow it. It's a bit of a reach, <laughs> but, uh, you know... <laughs> Listen, it's not as much as a reach. It's not as much of a reach as the guy on social media that has one of those uh, Porsche Centro DCO or whatever, the center seat oh, 911s, yes. the conversions. And he referenced McLaren F1 like three different times and talking about his car, how it was like a McLaren F1 just because it had a center driver's seat. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's no, you can't do that. You just built a less practical 911. Right. <laughs> He also said the Porsche factory engineers built it and oh, like, wow. it was, and no, it's done by a conversion company and they built a whole ton of them, but, uh, a whole ton more than anybody wanted anyway, which is like six. Uh, so anyway, th this thing looks great. The proportions are there. The quality is there. The interior looks like a real one. And a lot of the instrumentation and stuff is done better. In fact, it uses a vintage air air conditioning system. Uh, which I believe those are electric. They're not run by a compressor yeah. that's run off of the engine. Um, and, and honestly, that's a far better system than an early Lamborghini. <laughs> yeah. But like you think about it, and if you've seen early Lamborghinis, I've looked at a bunch of them at auctions. They don't age well. The, the Chrysler slash Lamborghini build quality was pretty darn terrible. And if you didn't know any better, you could say, well, this looks like a kit car, the way it's assembled and it's, they're, they're pretty stinking bad. Yeah. I've been around a couple and I'm always like the early ones. I think once you get to the, when they refresh the dashboard and especially once you get into the, the 6.0s, like that's a whole different beast, but they are, the yes. early ones are like, Oof, they, they just look cobbled together. Um, apparently, based on all these auction listings, none of their hoods close or their front <laughs> trunks close correctly. I don't know what's going on. All but. right. So we, we need to take a little <laughs> bit of a detour to a bad Diablo listing to kind of show how close the values were. And, and actually that this car, if you look it up and we'll put the link in the description, how much better 
this one was than a bad one. So there was a uh, white 91 Diablo first year that went on bring a trailer twice. And the first time it bid to 195 grand. So just about 25% more than, than a fake one, which is staggering how close they are. And it was not very well presented. There was an 11 second video of it dry revving. And that was the only video. Um, there was a lot of unanswered questions, but one of the biggest ones was the terrible gaps in the, the front trunk. The fitment was awful and it was very evident in the photos. And the irony was that the seller, when trying to defend the hood fitment, pulled up pictures of other Diablo <laughs> listings with similar <laughs> issues, except one of them was a listing where the photographer didn't close the front trunk in the listing, which is one that we covered in the past and made fun of the listing for like, how could you not do that? People are going to think the front trunk is all jacked up. And here that proved prophetically hilarious that this guy is now referencing that one to say, no, mine's fine. It's not jacked (laughs) up. No, that one was left open. Uh. Yours is jacked up. So anyway, little, little side detour there on, you know, how not to quite present a car. Although that car did get relisted, no reserve, and it sold for 235000 So again, not, uh, not even double what a fake one would go for. And if you look at different, uh, different models in terms of the, the real to the fake, right? So if you look at uh, a Cobra, like a Superformance Cobra, 100000 plus or minus, a real Cobra, a million, two yeah. million, depending on the provenance. Um, a uh, three fifty six Speedster, right? You have the the vintage recreations out of California. Vintage recre- vintage Speedsters. I don't know what their new company name is. Used to be Vintage Speedsters. Anyway, um, those are fifty grand plus or minus on the used side. Or if you look at like the Beck five fifty Spiders, same oh, yeah. price and real five fifty Spiders are in the seven figures. So I mean, gone many multiples. Uh, you know, factors of 10 between the fake one and the real one. And here this fake Diablo was so close to a real one. Is this a good analog or not analog, but is this a good representation of the Lamborghini kit car world? No, (laughs) no, it's not. Not at all. Although there is a company in England as well called uh, Prova that builds Countach kit cars that are to an incredibly high standard. And I would almost consider one of those over a real one because they're going to be far more reliable. They typically use a small block V8 and they're 100 to 150 grand versus three to 500 grand for a lesser desirable Countach up to a million for one of the Primo ones. But I think it always comes back to you're still driving a fake, right? It's a better car. Can you get over the stigma? So, and I think while not a Lambo, I don't remember the name of the company, so please forgive me, but there is a company that is making incredible recreations of 60s Mustangs right now. Are they, so are you talking about Ring Brothers? I don't think so. Um, there's another company as well. I know what you're talking about that does the 60s Mustangs, but they're not, they're using real chassis, aren't they? And the one I'm talking about is like, it's all new it's like new bodies new everything it's got like coyote motor so it's got like ford stuff in it but it's all brand new so they're doing like a singer style kind of there's just no donor car like they have their own vins that are not as far as i know they're not vins from like old 60s mustangs like it is a brand new thing interesting in its entirety and And they're probably charging five to ten x what you could get a real 66 yeah they're like three two or three hundred thousand dollars for these things but they look incredible I think there's a delineation here, an important one okay. that you've brought up that I didn't think about before. This is why I am here, Doug. <laughs> there's a lot of things I don't think about before I speak. Just ask my wife. Uh, the resto mod or kind of the, the, the singer recreation, uh, and not fad, but the trend of we're going to take an old car that people love, but that has a lot of weaknesses and we're going to either use an original chassis or we're going to start from scratch, but we're going to build a car that's better in every way that has modern amenities, that has reliability, that has more horsepower, that's 
has everything that people want in terms of creature comforts and drivability, but still the nostalgia of the old car. And they're building half million, million dollar cars and appealing to the super rich who want to relive this experience of an old car without all the downsides of it. And then you just have fake kit cars that are trying to be almost as good as the real one for a lot less money so people can have that experience without paying the the tax for the badge, kind of like a fake Rolex. And I, I yeah. The company is called Revology. That Revology. That's right. That's what I was. It was Thank really you. bugging me. Thank you. Um, but on one side, you have your own status symbol because you say, I have a singer or I have a Revology or I have a Ring Brothers. On the other side, it's, is that a real one? No, it's a fake. It's yeah. a kick car. No matter how good it is, if somebody asks, is it a real one? You got to say no. And then it's the explanation. It's like when somebody, you know, it's like, oh, is that a man? Is that a stick? It's like, no. <laughs> it's like, Bleh. yeah, yeah. So, but I do think there's something to be said for things like this. And in my head, I've always thought of like the, the, the Cobra recreations as a great way. If you really love that to just buy something you can beat the crap out of yes. and enjoy. Yeah, even though I would it's not fake. buy a real Cobra because nobody would ever assume that it was real. That's true because you most can't of them tell are the fake. Difference and most of them are fake. Like when I see one driving around and it's not like a behind velvet rope or at Amelia or something, I'm like, that's fake. The guy, yeah. that guy's just having a good time. Yep. But I don't think less of them. But I think the Cobra is the only thing I feel that way about. True. That's true. so weird. Uh, 356, the speedsters and stuff. I think I don't, well, if they got the silly hips, yeah, they've that's added right. the, the wide like body really ones are silly. Wide that's body right. Ones. But if you have a good one that looks original, it's every bit as, as what a 356 is. It's a yes. tiny Volkswagen <laughs> engine and a crap chassis. Like <laughs> there's not much to 356s. <laughs> They're not great cars. Uh, so like to build a fake one, like honestly that the, that chassis is what a lot of people used as basis for other yeah. kit cars. So it's like, well, you're yeah. Anyway. All right. Speaking of kit cars, um, just to let you know, we haven't lost touch with our origins. We found a terrible kit car on marketplace. This is of course a Lamborghini Countach kit car. And I love this because the, the opening picture <laughs> is that of a real anniversary Countach, but oh. with the text, Quote, sample picture of car style, selling a replica project car of this car style. <laughs> I love the English is just, it's an odd way to say all of that. Replica is capitalized for some reason. It looks like the, the font is two different colors. <laughs> like it's and so then good. the next picture, it looks like a go-kart that got in an accident and got <laughs> hammered out into an attempt at a Lamborghini Countach. It looks so bad. It's so, so and bad. And it's also all... like a photo from so far away, and it looks like the Midwest after the snow is melted, but it's still wintertime, so it's gray and miserable, and there's nothing, on, there's no life around on the trees or anything. Like They didn't even spell Fiero right when talking about the donor car. <laughs> Uh, I like that they said, though, the, first, the next picture is, is next to a, a BMW 3 Series. The car for sale in the, is the red car parked next to the black BMW in the driveway. <laughs> no kidding. Thank you. Very, I very was, descriptive. I wasn't sure. If you are handy with cars and can spend some time completing this Lamborghini project car, <laughs> there it is, you will have one of the most eye-catching car ever made. I, <sighs> my eye will be catching diseases looking at that. I it says, please note, replica cars are not the actual Lamborghini Countach car, which can cost up to $500,000 for this make and model car. Good golly. About 80% completed. Runs and drive. About 80% of the custom work build work is done, although it needs some more work done. <laughs> About three years ago, it felt like the front passenger side wheel bearing started wearing and brake line out. <laughs> So it doesn't really run and drive. That was three years ago. It's been parked, I would assume. <laughs> well, it says run and runs and drive, although need front end wheel bear. And then later down in the listing, we'll need to be towed. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, man. Yep. Typical, typical kit car. 
This episode is brought to you by Sheffield All Sport Watches. The Sheffield brand was recently revived by Jay Turkbus, an owner of an original Sheffield All Sport diver he received from his parents in 1970 when he was just 11, beginning his love of watches. As an adult, Jay used his extensive expertise in product development and marketing to revive the brand that started it all. He set out to develop watches with a high level of quality and specification at a value price. His first effort and a successful one in July of 2023 was the debut of the Sheffield All Sport Diver 1. It had the kind of build and movement that much more expensive watches use, and his debut price of $108 was equivalent to the $13 his parents paid back in 1970. Since that debut, Sheffield has expanded to a wider range of automatics and chronos, many designed around vintage Sheffield dials of the 60s. The Sheffield well of clever and unique design remains his inspiration as well as maintaining the goal of high quality, very affordable range of automatic and quartz watches. Sheffield watches value on merit, not just price. I love mine. Get yours at SheffieldWatches.com and mention that you heard about them on SwitchCast. Thank you for joining us for SwitchCast with Doug Tabbitt and Tyler Sanders, produced by Ethan Huffnagel. SwitchCast is an automotive entertainment and opinion show, and nothing we say should be taken very seriously. We do not give tax, investment, legal, emotional, or professional advice, and the only licenses we hold are driver's licenses. The opinions expressed on this show are exclusively held by the people pontificating at that moment and do not reflect the values of our producers or sponsors. Our theme music is provided by Emily and Ivory. You can stream their full album on Spotify or SoundCloud. If you like this show, you can stream it in its entirety on your favorite audio podcast platform. Check out switchcast.live for more info. Music